All right. Good evening, everyone. Um, if your name's not already listed, um, if you could just put your name in the chat so I can just uh, send you the post assessment questions after the CE, that would be great. Um, in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and get started. All right, so good evening. Today I'm going to be presenting on my CE crisis averted prevention and management of sickle cell disease um, induced basal occlusive pain. I have no financial interests or any other interest to disclose. And the objectives for today. So first objective is to illustrate the prevalence and epidemiology of sickle cell disease to describe the pathophysiology of sickle cell disease and its resulting complications to outline the management of an acute basal occlusive crisis, and to define the pharmacology of newly approved agents for the treatment of sickle cell disease. And lastly, to review the safety and efficacy outcomes from clinical trials evaluating novel therapies for sickle cell disease. So what exactly is sickle cell disease? So sickle cell disease is this group of inherited red blood cell disorders, and these um, genetic inherited red blood cell disorders result in the red blood cells having this um, abnormal shape, hence the sickle shape with kind of like a crescent moon you see here. And these patients can go on to develop other comorbidities um, along with their sickle cell disease, such as anemia, episodes of pain, frequent infections, et cetera. And for some epidemiology, so this is the most common inherited blood disorder in the United States that affects approximately 100,000 Americans. Um, and the worldwide prevalence is estimated to be around 3.2 million people. And this affects people of African, Mediterranean, Arabian, Indian, and Hispanic descent. Um, sickle cell disease does occur in about one out of every 365 African-American births, and in about one out of every 16,000 Hispanic American births. The most common subtype of sickle cell disease is sickle cell anemia, which is unfortunately the most severe subtype of sickle cell disease. And this occurs in about two thirds of those with sickle cell disease. Um, so the median life expectancy has increased. Um, from in 1979, the median age at death was about 28 years, but in 2017, it increased to 43 years, but we still have a long way to go. Um, and also in helping manage the quality of life that these patients have with living with their, in their disease state. So there's different types of sickle cell disease I wanna briefly review. So we have hemoglobin SS, which is the most common and most severe form of the disease. So in hemoglobin SS, it's an autosomal recessive disease where the patient, where the person might receive one sickle cell gene from each parent in order to get the disease. We also have hemoglobin SC, which is one sickled cell gene or one S gene from one parent, and then another gene of another abnormal hemoglobin called C. And this forms a little bit milder. There's also hemoglobin S beta thalassemia, which is another different type of anemia. Um, and the severity on that can also be based off of the type of beta thalassemia that the patient has. There's also other subtypes such as HBSD, SE, and SO, but basically this just means that the patient's inheriting one sickle cell gene as well as another um, gene encoding for an abnormal type of hemoglobin. But the severity of those rare types varies um, and they are again, pretty rare. And then outside of sickle cell disease, we have the sickle cell trait, which is HBAS, so hemoglobin A is the normal hemoglobin that's in our body. So patients would inherit one of those genes and then another um, sickle cell gene from the other parent. And usually these patients do not show any signs of the disease, but they can pass along the trait to their children. And this is just a little square kind of to reiterate how a patient might get the recessive gene. So if two pa um, parents who have the, the sickle cell trait have four children, about one in four of those children will go on to develop sickle cell disease, um, two with the sickle cell trait and one with normal hemoglobin. Okay, and now kind of just review the normal red blood cell and hemoglobin functions. So hemoglobin is made up, is composing, helping compose the red blood cell. So within the red blood cell, we have all these different hemoglobins and their function is to help allow red blood cells to carry oxygen from the lungs to the various tissues in the body. And is also a carrier for carbon dioxide to go from other parts of the body back to the lungs. Now going into what hemoglobin looks like. 
So this here is hemoglobin A. It's the most abundant hemoglobin that's in our bodies. Um, you might recognize hemoglobin A from when we look at the A1C in patients um, with diabetes. Um, but this hemoglobin is composed of a heme group, which is the iron containing portion, and then the globin chains, which are the proteins. And the hemoglobin A specifically has two alpha chains and two beta globin chains. Now, what exactly is hemoglobin S? So hemoglobin S occurs secondary to this point mutation of the beta globin gene. So kind of like how I mentioned, hemoglobin A has the two alpha and the two beta chains. Hemoglobin S is a mutation that occurs in the beta chain of the hemoglobin. Um, and hemoglobin S will cause the red blood cell to sickle during times of stress or hypoxia. And due to them developing this um, sickled shape, um, the body tries to destruct these abnormal red blood cells. So these cells tend to have a little bit shorter of a lifespan of 10 to 15 days, rather um, compared to regular normal red blood cells and hemoglobin that can be circulating our system for up to 120 days. So expanding a little bit more on the pathophysiology, so like I mentioned before, this all occurs from a substitution of an amino acid in the beta globin chain of the hemoglobin. So after this mutation occurs, the hemoglobin in times where it's deoxygenated or not carrying or bound to oxygen, the mutated hemoglobin molecules polymerize or combine to form these bundles. And the polymer bundles result in the red blood cell sickling. This polymerization also promotes hemolysis or destruction of the red blood cells and can lead to a whole cascade of other pathologic events. And one of these events is vasoocclusion. So the sickling of cells results in this aggregation or clumping of sickle red blood cells with neutrophils, platelets, and endothelial cells to promote the blockage of blood flow, which is referred to as vasoocclusion. There's also increased red blood cell endothelium interactions um, and also oxidative stress that can occur secondary to this, um, promoting endothelial dysfunction as well as inflammation in our body. And over time, the, the fact that these um, red blood cells sickle and then unsickle, depending on whether or not they're oxygenated, overall, uh, over time, there could be damage to the cell membrane, which also makes it lose its pliability that was important for red blood cells to help pass them through the small capillaries. So then I have our first questions here, just to kind of go over a little bit of the background and pathophysiology. Which of the following genotypes is not a type of sickle cell disease, but represents the gene carried by someone with a sickle cell trait? Just to give you a clue, the normal hemoglobin would be hemoglobin A. So that can help you figure out the answer. And the second one would be sickle cell disease is caused by mutation in the hemoglobin's alpha globin, true or false? Yes, so the first answer is C, and the second answer is indeed false. So the sickle cell disease is caused by mutation in the hemoglobin's beta globin. So now moving on to clinical manifestations. So among the disease manifestations are delayed growth and development, and this can occur secondary to the red blood cells. Um, usually being able to provide the body with oxygen and nutrients needed for growth. But due to these um, vasoocclusive episodes that can occur, there's a shortage of healthy red blood cells that can slow the growth in children. In addition, sickle cells can damage the spleen, increasing vulnerability to infections. So usually the spleen helps clear out um, circulating encapsulated bacteria. Um, however, when it's injured, um, it's, patients might be more at risk for infections from organisms such as pneumococcal organisms or even um, Haemophilus influenzae. Um, also, mi microinfarcts can occur, which can cause severe pain in these patients, um, as well as macroinfarcts that can even um, affect um, organs, and there could be organ damage, as well as anemia. So as a result of accelerated red blood cell destruction, sickle cell patients have these laboratory fi test findings characteristic of hemolysis. So since sickle cell buds are also, sickle red blood cells are less cap capable to carry oxygen, this leads to anemia. So patients can become symptomatic, which includes them presenting with fatigue, weakness, and overall dizziness. 
So now what exactly is a vasoocclusive crisis? So we kind of went through the pathophysiology before, but basically there's this ischemic injury to the organ that the red blood cell was supplying oxygen to, and there's this resultant pain that can occur. Um, so usually this is initiated by an inflammatory or environmental stimulus, such as an infection, hypo hypoxia, acidosis, sudden temperature, altitude changes, or even dehydration. And these events can lead to there being um, occlusion of the microvasculature, macrovasculature um, due to this occurrence. There's also other acute complications that can result as a, a result of this basal occlusion. So for example, sickled cells can even clog the blood flow to the brain, which can cause a stroke. And there's also um, sickled cells that can block the flow to the lungs and cause this acute chest syndrome, which is a life-threatening condition that similarly, similarly presents like a pneumonia with patients having some chest pain, coughing, or difficulty breathing. Um, this might even be incited by an infection, but this is another serious complication that patients can present with secondary to this basal occlusion that occurs. But for this presentation, I'm going to be focusing more on the pain crises since it's the most abundant reason for um, sickle cell related hospital admissions. Um, this pain that they, that, um, they get is the sudden onset of very excruciating pain that's commonly localized to the abdomen, chest, back, or joints. And this can occur any time in their lifetime, even as early as only six months of age. Um, and I, like I mentioned before, sometimes there could be different inciting causes. Um, so we want to check out their fluids, electrolytes, any acid base and abnormalities, as well as oxygen saturating to saturation to see if there's anything we can do to help rehydrate them or give them supplemental oxygen if necessary. And of course, we want to help manage their pain. So more on the pain complication of pain. So severe pain is the most common complication of sickle cell disease, and it really impacts someone's quality of life, whether it's a pediatric patient where, um, where they might um, have to miss school secondary to these really painful episodes, or even adults who might have to miss work, which can also pose a financial burden to them as well. And this pain could either be acute or chronic. Um, chronic pain tends to emerge with increasing age after they have these repeated episodes of vasoocclusion that can cause damage to some of the uh, blood vessels as well as the different organs. Um, and then acute pain can range anywhere from more mild pain to more severe pain. And unfortunately, there's no one answer to how and how to manage this pain. And it's really um, patient oriented where we have conversations with the patient to help best manage um, their care. So for the acute pain management, I'm gonna be focusing more on severe acute pain. And this is pain that results in any unplanned visit to an acute care setting for treatment. So acute care setting would be like an emergency department, um, an outpatient clinic, an infusion center, or even inpatient at the hospital where we are. So the American Society of Hematology 2020 guidelines recommend that with patients who are presenting for severe acute pain, that within one hour of their arrival to the emergency department or hospital, we should have a rapid assessment of their pain as well as administration of analgesia. So this includes um, usually IV pain medication since these patients are presenting for more severe pain. Um, if it was more mild to moderate pain that they might have been able to handle at home, they might have already trialed some acetaminophen or some NSAIDs and without um, success and still are looking for further pain management. So in this case, we really wanna make sure we get them started on analgesics as soon as we can as well as frequently reassessing them every half hour or so to make sure that their pain is being adequately treated. And of course, tailoring the therapy to the treatment to the patient. These are different examples of different pain assessment tools. We have the visual analog scale as well as the patient global impression of change to help monitor any changes um, in their pain. But going more into the pharmacologic therapies, so we have here a multimodal analgesia approach, which means helping combine different medications to best optimize their pain. So really first line would be rapid IV opioids. 
And again, I just want to emphasize that we aren't really starting with the IV Tylenol or the NSAIDs in these patients right away, since these patients have really, again, severe excruciating um, pain that at home they were not able to manage with NSAIDs. So usually it's recommended that they initiate IV opioids. And also, again, with the multimodal approach, having a short course of five to seven days of NSAIDs in addition to the opioids. Um, but we also want to take in any patient factors into consideration, such as whether or not they have any underlying renal dysfunction or any underlying peptic ulcer disease, peptic ulcer disease or full dose anticoagulation when deciding whether or not to also add NSAIDs. Um, we also avoid against, we want to avoid against using steroids. Um, so basically the guidelines recommend against steroid use because there is a study that was done that showed in patients with um, severe vasoclusive pain episodes, um, patients that received steroids actually um, came back to the hospital after discharge for more severe rebound pain. So that's just something to note. But if they need steroids for another reason, let's say an asthma exacerbation, then that would be warranted. But for treating pain, we don't really recommend using steroids for their anti-inflammatory effect. And of course, we have our supportive care. We really only want to give IV fluids if the patient is dehydrated and oxygen if the patient is hypoxic. And when we give these intravenous opioids, um, we want to make sure that they're given around the clock or scheduled. Um, we could even consider a continuous basal infusion of IV opioids, but we want to make sure that their pain is getting covered throughout the day. We also want to take into consideration the patient home dose of opioids. So mostly, most of the times, this isn't the patient's first episode of vasoclusive pain, and they are discharged on some opioid pain medications to help take on the outpatient side when they experience maybe more moderate versions or severe versions of these episodes. Um, so we want to take into consideration those doses since these patients wouldn't be opioid naive, as well as every time we're reassessing them every half hour, we can consider escalating their dose by about 25% until their pain is adequately controlled. It's also recommended to use patient-controlled analgesia for any breakthrough pain. However, the guidelines don't recommend for or against a basal IV opioid infusion with that PCA pump. But again, just making sure that they're getting pain medications around the clock. And since they are using a lot of opioids, we do wanna monitor for side effects. So for any refractory or uncontrolled pain, um, the guidelines recommend using sub-anesthetic ketamine infusion. So this would be a lot lower of doses, such as 0.1 to 0.3 milligrams per kilogram per hour. Um, and if, again, that doesn't work, there's also regional anesthesia. That's an option for this refractory pain, especially pain that might be localized to a few areas, such as the abdomen, hip, or leg. And in conjunction with these pharmacologic therapies, there are also some non-pharmacologic approaches that I have listed here that the guidelines also recommend. I know when I was um, in the pediatric hemonc unit that they had um, uh, TVs and video games for the patients that might come in with a sickle cell crisis to help aid in distraction in addition to their medications to help optimize their pain management. And just a kind of guideline summary of what I reviewed. So with patients who come in with a severe uh, vasoclusive pain episode, we want to make sure that we assess and treat them within 60 minutes. And we want to make sure we also reassess them every half hour or so to make sure that they are getting their pain treated um, to the best of our ability. In regards to pharmacologic options, we have IV opioids. Um, once it starts to show an effect, we can maybe try um, gradually de decreasing the dose as well as possibly transitioning to um, oral opioids. Um, but NSAIDs are another option um, as well as ketamine and regional anesthesia for refractory pain. And lastly, um, it might be a good idea to help create plans for these patients on how to, how to handle more mild to moderate pain at home and educate them on when it might be best for them to come into the ED for severe um, pain management. Um, so the incidence of acute pain episodes cannot be prevented completely, but there are some certain therapies that can be helpful in helping minimize the frequency or intensity of the pain. So these are different therapies that have come out um, over the years. More familiar, we have hydroxyurea listed here, as well as 
L-glutamine, Vuxelator, and Crizinlozumab. So hydroxyurea is the oldest drug we have for sickle cell disease. Um, it was FDA approved for sickle cell disease in 1998. And it was the only drug that was really used to help manage the disease state for about two decades up until 2017 when L-glutamine was FDA approved. And then soon after in 2019, we had Vuxelator and Crizinlizumab be approved. Um, and in the future, we might even expect some gene therapies that are currently being studied um, to try to help either treat or even cure the disease state in that aspect. So first I'm gonna review hydroxyurea. Um, the more brand names are Droxia or Cyclos. So this medication was actually used in the 1960s, um, originally as an antineoplastic drug for the treatment of multiple cancers. Um, and in 1998, it became approved for sickle cell disease. And more recently in 2017, it had another indication to help treat sickle cell disease in pediatric patients um, over the year of over two years old. But basically the goal is to help decrease the frequency of painful crises and decrease the need for blood transfusions in those with recurrent moderate to severe painful crises. Um, it also can be used off label in children, um, usually like at least six to nine months of age. So the initial dose for infants, children, and adolescents would be 20 milligrams per kilogram once daily. And the initial dose for adults is 15 milligrams per kilogram once daily with a max dose of 35 milligrams per kilogram per day. Um, it's a pretty, um, it's been used for many years and it does have a black box warning for severe myelosuppression, which kind of makes sense since it was also used to help treat different cancers. Um, but myelosuppression is not something we really want in these patients. So that's definitely something to keep an eye out for. And also just to note too, these doses I bolded because they are a little bit lower than the hydroxyurea dosing for um, as an antineoplastic drug for um, treating different cancers or hyperleukocytosis, the dosing is 50 to 100 milligrams per kilogram per day, as opposed to the 15 and 20 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day we would start these patients on. So hydroxyurea has a really unique mechanism of action. Um, so the way um, it helps treat different cancers is that it's this anti-metabolite that blocks the function of this enzyme ribonucleotide reductase. And by stopping this enzyme, it's stopping the conversion to deoxyribonucleotide triphosphates, which interferes with DNA synthesis and repair overall. However, its mechanism for sickle cell disease is a little bit more unique. So hydroxyurea helps increase fetal hemoglobin or hemoglobin F. Hemoglobin F is the form of hemoglobin that's normally produced during fetal development. So while the infants or babe, fetus is in the womb, um, there's this hemoglobin F circulating around that has a little bit more of an affinity for oxygen than um, the mother's regular hemoglobin A so that the oxygen could go to the fetus to help it grow. Um, and these babies then once they're born, they usually have the hemoglobin F circulating around up until six to nine months of age which correlates with when these patients may start to have symptoms. But hemoglobin F is put in the fact where it has two alpha and two gamma chains instead of the beta chains where the sickle cell disease mutation occurs. So by um, hydroxyurea increasing the gene expression for the gamma globin, um, there's more hemoglobin F that's produced and less of the hemoglobin A that can be um, hurt, that can end up sickling. So this increased hemoglobin F overall inhibits this polymerization or bundling of hemoglobin S that ends up um, leading to the red blood cell to sickle. And since it does interfere with DNA synthesis and repair of different cells, there's gonna be decrease in circulating leukocytes as well as an alteration in the expression of different adhesion molecules, which overall helps decrease vasoocclusion. So some clinical pearls for hydroxyurea. So there's different formulations. We have capsules and tablets. There's no commercially available liquid for hydroxyurea. However, there is a new um, name, brand name drug, Cyclos, that's available as 100 milligram and a score 1,000 milligram tablet that can be dissolved in water for the pediatric populations or those who are unable to take tablets. Um, it is a hazardous agent. Um, and since the dosing is usually initiated at 15 to 20 milligrams per kilogram per day, 
We try to increase the dose every few months or so to the maximal tolerated dose of 35 milligrams per kilogram per day, or we increase it to a dose that does not produce the severe myelosuppression. So our goal is to help go as high as we can on the dose to help minimize the pain crises, but also make sure that this patient isn't experiencing isn't experiencing any severe myelosuppression secondary to this medication. So we do want to monitor the blood counts every few weeks or so, especially when it's initiated. And just an FYI, there is a renal dose adjustment for the initial dose. For anyone with a creatinine clearance less than 60, we would want to initiate at half the dose. So instead of 15 milligrams per kilogram per day in adult, we would initiate at 7.5 milligrams per kilogram per day. Next, we have L-glutamine or Indari, which is an amino acid oral powder. Um, it's good to differentiate that this is a pharmaceutical grade formulation of L-glutamine. There are some over-the-counter like nutritional supplements that are out there as well, but that hasn't been studied um, since we don't really have um, consistent formulations for them. But L-glutamine um, was FDA approved in July of 2017 for reducing acute complications of, of sickle cell disease in patients at least five years of age. The dosing is weight-based and can range anywhere from 15, five to 15 grams um, by mouth twice daily, depending on your weight. So an adult usually weighing over 65 kilograms would have 15 grams per dose or 30 grams per day. And the side effects are pretty mild in that patients may just be experiencing some mild GI upset from this medication. So how does L-glutamine help in sickle cell disease? So its exact mechanism in reducing pain crises is unclear, but it's related to this role in, in, in helping decrease oxidative stress. So L-glutamine is a conditionally essential amino acid, which means that it's necessary um, usually in times of stress. Um, and L-glutamine is needed to help synthesize NAD plus or nicotinamide adenine dinucleotide. And this um, NAD plus is an antioxidant. So by increasing the synthesis of NAD plus, it's hoping to promote the redox, re redox reaction to occur and to help reduce oxidative stress. So the study that led to L-glutamine's approval was this randomized double-blind phase three multicenter study that was conducted in the United States from June 2010 to December 2013. Patients ranged anywhere from five to 58 years of age. And there are only 230 patients that were randomized two to one to either treatment with L-glutamine or treatment to placebo. Um, and these patients had to have at least two pain crises in the past year. The study mainly looked at the median number of occurrences of sickle cell crises during the 48 week treatment period. And a pain crisis was defined as pain leading to treatment with a parenterally administered narcotic or Toradol, or Ketorolac, and an emergency department or hospitalization. So this study showed that the median number of occurrences of sickle cell crises was about three with L-glutamine and four with placebo, which was statistically significant. So we can conclude that L-glutamine helped decrease the frequency of painful crises and hospitalization associated with sickle cell disease. And also just wanted to note that about two thirds of these patients were also on hydroxyurea at baseline. And this effect was seen in um, both groups overall. So some clinical pearls for L-glutamine. So it comes as this powder in a packet and it can be mixed with 240 mLs of water or any other non-heated beverage. We're also mixed with four to six ounces of non-heated foods before immediately being ingested. And if you are mixing it, in water or like a soft food, it does not need to be completely dissolved in order to um, administer it. Um, and it also may need to be obtained from a specialty pharmacy, which is important to note, especially in patients getting discharged, helping to navigate um, where they're able to obtain this medication. Next, we have the medication Vuxelator or Oxbrita, and this is a hemoglobin S polymerization inhibitor. So as FDA approved in November of 2019 for the treatment of sickle cell disease in adults and pediatric patients at least four years of age, it was originally at least 12 years of age, but recently, um, just this December of 2021, it got um, FDA approved in children at least four years of age as well. So the adult dose is about 1500 milligrams once daily, and the pediatric dose is weight-based. So it can range anywhere from 600 milligrams once daily 
to 1500 milligrams once daily once they weigh at least 40 kilograms. Um, it's also available as 500 milligram tablets and their side effects are also pretty mild, anywhere from mild GI upset or a skin rash. So Vexellator has a really unique mechanism in that it helps stabilize the oxygenated state of hemoglobin, which prevents hemoglobin S from polymerizing by increasing the hemoglobin's affinity for oxygen. So like I mentioned earlier, the red blood cell tends to sickle in periods of deoxygenation. So it helps keep the hemoglobin oxygenated so that does not occur. So overall, it can help inhibit red blood cell sickling, improve red blood cell deformability, as well as reduce whole blood viscosity. So the evidence that led to Voxillator's approval was this phase three randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multicenter study called the HOPE trial. And this enrolled patients from January 2017 to May of 2018. And there's about 274 patients that were enrolled with a baseline hemoglobin of 5.5 to 10.5, and with one to two vasoclusive crises within the past year. So these patients were randomized one to one to one to receive either oral high dose of Exolator 1500 milligrams or 900 milligrams or placebo for up to 72 weeks. And this primarily looked at the percent of participants who had a hemoglobin response, which was defined of having an increase of hemoglobin by at least one gram per deciliter from baseline at week 24. Um, so it did actually have a difference um, in the high dose voxillator group. Um, it had a significantly higher percentage of participants with a hemoglobin response. However, looking at one of the other secondary endpoints, the incidence of vasoclusive crises did not differ significantly among trial groups, which is really important to note. But overall, it helps significantly increase hemoglobin levels and reduce markers of hemolysis or red blood cell destruction. So some clinical pearls for Voxellator. We don't want to cut or crush or chew those tablets. However, there is a newer soluble formulation that is available of a soluble tablet. And if we are counseling patients on this medication, um, we, can, we have to check the package insert to see um, how much volume we should disperse the tablet in depending on the dose that's given. Um, we also wanna dose adjust for any severe hepatic impairment, so child pew class C. And if we see these drugs, um, it is a CYP3A4 substrate. So with any inhibitors or inducers, we would need to dose adjust the Voxellator dose. So our last drug we have here is crizinlizumab or DACVL. And this is an anti-P selectin humanized monoclonal antibody. So this was more recently approved in November of 2019 to help reduce the frequency of vasoclusive crises in adults and pediatric patients at least 16 years of age with sickle cell disease. So it's an IV infusion that's dosed five milligrams per kilogram once every two weeks for two doses, followed by five milligrams per kilogram once every month thereafter. And also pretty mild adverse effects. I mean, patients might experience some muscle aches or arthralgias as well as some mild GI upset or possible infusion related reactions. Crizinlizumab also has a unique mechanism in that it binds to P-selectin on the surface of activated endothelium and platelets and inhibits these interactions between the endothelial cells, the platelets, red blood cells, and leukocytes. So it prevents this um, aggregation that usually occurs that leads to vasoocclusion. And this medication was approved after the SUSTAIN trial was published. So this was a phase two randomized double-blind placebo-controlled multicenter study. Patients were aged 16 to 65 years old and had to have, a, again, at least two vasoclusive crises in the past year. Um, and these patients were randomized, 198 patients were randomized one-to-one-to-one -to, -one -to, -one to receive high-dose crizolizumab, low-dose crizolizumab, or placebo. That was um, administered for a total of 50 weeks, a uh, 50-week period. Um, so this was also mainly looking at the medium and median annual rate of vasoclusive crises, and it showed that there was a statistical significance decrease in the median annual rate of vasoclusive crises in the high dose crizolizumab group, so 1.63 versus placebo of 2.98. And the um, so there's a 45.3 percent lower rate with high dose crizolizumab when comparing it to placebo. So overall, we can say that it really did result in significantly lower rate of sickle cell related pain crises than placebo, 
and was also associated with a pretty low incidence of adverse effects. And again, these patients were also on hydroxyurea at baseline, about two thirds of them. So some clinical pearls for adaxio. So it's an IV infusion that's administered over 30 minutes. Um, it does have a short stability once it's, um, the vials are reconstituted or diluted, um, but that's if it's out of the refrigerator, it would be about four and a half hours, but refrigerated up to 24 hours. Um, and again, we can see some infusion related reactions with this medication. So if patients do experience any infusion re related reactions, we can recommend either slowing down the infusion or temporarily stopping the infusion. And then for future doses, possibly pre-medicating these patients to help prevent any infusion related reactions. And since it is a newer medication that's available, um, it is pretty expensive. So there's some manufacturer copay assistance programs we can also help um, patients find to obtain this medication. So my next question is, which of the following is not a counseling point we can make when counseling a patient on L-glutamine? Okay, so the answer is, B, thank you. So we don't wanna mix L-glutamine with any hot beverage like coffee or soup. We really wanna keep it at a non-heated beverage. So like um, possibly juice or water or milk. And if we are mixing it with about four to six ounces of food, we want something with more of an applesauce or yogurt-like consistency. So this is a drug summary that I have here looking at the different agents I just reviewed. So the therapeutic effects are listed there for your reference, as well as the FDA improved age ages, um, as well as the costs. So hydroxyurea has been on the market the longest and has generics available. So it's definitely the most affordable at about $1.64 a capsule in comparison to crizinlizumab, which is newer and it's a monoclonal antibody. So it's about $287 per ml. So for a 70 kilogram patient, one dose would be estimated to be around $10,000, as well as L-glutamine that can add up. So patients who might be on 15 grams twice daily might also have an additive monthly cost as well. So there are actually no guidelines that have been published after these new therapies have come out. The last guidelines for sickle cell disease management was in 2014 from the National Heart, Lung, and Blood Institute, which is a subset of the NIH. And they recommended hydroxyurea as a first drug of choice for all age groups starting as young as nine months, since it has been the most effective therapy for reducing vasoclusive pain. Um, so based on the different studies that have come out, um, for patients who might not be tolerating hydroxyurea due to having severe myelosuppression or patients who are having persistent um, pain crises despite being on their maximum dose of hydroxyurea, it might be, um, Good to help recommend L-glutamine or crizinlizumab for those patients, since those two are the medications that also help statistically significantly decrease the amount of pain crises per year. So that once you have narrowed down to those two, you can take into consideration different patient factors such as age. So patients um, who want crizinlizumab have to be at least 16 years of age, but I do believe there's some ongoing trials now looking at crizinlizumab use in younger age groups. Um, and some patients might just prefer an oral powder versus an IV infusion or vice versa. Some patients might not want to take this medication twice a day and they might prefer once monthly infusion of crizinlizumab. So there, those are all different factors we could take into consideration. Um, and Vexelator um, did not show that it was able to decrease the amount of vasoclusive pain crises or vasoclusive crises. Um, it really helped um, increase the amount of hemoglobin in patients who might have severe anemia. So I would maybe recommend this medication in patients who have a symptomatic um, severe anemia. Um, but I do believe there are also some ongoing studies looking to see if there's any specific subgroups that might be eligible for Vuxelator as well. So it's being studied to see if there's a certain subgroup that could benefit from having decreased vasoclusive crises with Vuxelator itself. But overall, hydroxyurea is still going to be our mainstay of therapy since we don't have any evidence to say otherwise. And L-glutamine and crizinlizumab could be good options for adjunctive therapy. So some other management considerations. So again, 
patients with sickle cell disease might have a damaged spleen, which can make them more predisposed to different infections um, from especially pneumococcal infections. So we wanna make sure they're up to date on their pneumonia vaccines. We also want to make sure they're adequately hydrated um, to help prevent vasoocclusive episodes. Um, and I just wanna to touch upon blood transfusions. Um, blood transfusions aren't really used to help treat any acute pain for patients that come in for pain. However, it is really indicated in patients who present with severe anemia who are symptomatic, as well as patients who are presenting with a stroke. So that's when blood transfusions are more commonly used. Um, and there is no cure for sickle cell disease with any of these medications. The only cure would be a stem cell transplant, but unfortunately it is hard for these patients to find a matched donor. And we also have to weigh the risk versus benefits of them having complications from the stem cell transplant, such as um, rejection of the transplant, which can lead to another plethora of different problems. Um, but I did also want to touch upon gene therapy. I did see a few articles showing that there's um, genome editing that uses um, patient stem cells to help cure sickle cell disease. So basically by inserting an anti-sickling globin gene into patient cells. Um, and I'm interested to see more results on that as well. So just a final takeaway for the severe management of vasoclusive pain crises. So severe pain management, we want to make sure these patients receive timely inpatient care with IV opioids, as well as really try to individualize their management approach, taking into consideration what medications have helped the patient in the past, and including the patient in those conversations when helping discuss how to best manage their pain. Um, there are also multiple drug therapies FDA approved for the prevention of vasoclusive pain crises. So we have hydroxyurea as first line still, and we also have the option now to add on crisinlizumab or L-glutamine to see if that can help as well. Um, I'm also interested to see if there's any other trials that come out comparing these different medications um, head to head to see if that would change um, therapy practice as well as maybe future guidelines that outline their role in therapy further. And of course, these are again, your medications. So really trying to help patients um, know figure out that there are a lot of manufacturer cost assistance programs when helping um, figure out payment for these medications. I just want to also bring some awareness that June 19th is World Sickle Cell Day. I acknowledge Amanda for um, all her help. And that's all I have for today. So